let's talk about special relativity and one of the go-to thought experiments in special relativity, the light clock. So the first thing is in special relativity, there are two like basic assumptions of the system. They're called the postulates. Postulate is like an underlying, hey, let's, let's assume this and then see what happens. The first uh, postulate of special relativity is, hey, let's uh, say that the speed of light in a vacuum, but we just abbreviate it and call it the speed of light, is the same in all reference frames. That's kind of a weird thing to, to assume, but we've got data to back this up. It actually does happen. The speed of light being the same in all reference frames. If I'm in a car, yeah, check out my car, I'm moving at say 10% the speed of light, and then I turn my headlights on. This rule says that relative to me in the car, I see the light coming this way at C, right? The light looks like it's doing C. And relative to some observer elsewhere who's not moving at 10% the speed of light, I'm moving at 10% the speed of light relative to them. They see the headlights also moving at C. Not at C plus 10% of C, not at 110% of the speed of light, as you would expect if, uh, if light wasn't frankly so weird. But instead, what we see is that light always travels at the speed of light in a vacuum. It always travels at 300 million meters a second in a vacuum. The second postulate says all inertial reference frames are equally valid. There's no one best reference frame. There's no uniform, uh, no universal stationary. You can't be moving relative to the universe. It also says, like sort of implicitly it implies, an inertial reference frame is a reference frame where the law of inertia holds. So Newton's first law of motion says Stuff doesn't move unless you poke it. That's the law of inertia. That's what makes it an inertial reference frame. An inertial reference frame is any object that's not accelerating. So a spaceship coasting through space, doesn't matter how fast it's going. If it's not got its thrusters moving, if it's not like throwing stuff out behind it to accelerate itself, you know, and we'll go interstellar space. So we're not near any planets or stars. There's no force of gravity on it. It's just going in a straight line that way. That's an inertial reference frame. Um, an often used inertial reference frame is like a train on a straight track, because we can consider that to be one dimensional motion. As long as it's not accelerating, that's a nice example of a inertial reference frame. So let's look at a light clock. So let's take two mirrors, some distance L apart, and let's set L for convenience's sake, we'll set it to be 150 million meters. So 150 million meters means that light leaves here, goes up to the top and comes back down. That tick, right, it's gonna tick every time the light bounces off the bottom mirror, that tick takes one second because it takes half a second to reach here and half a second to come back. If I'm standing next to the mirrors, now these mirrors obviously can't actually exist. This is what Einstein would call a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. Cool, if you're stationary relative to this thing, that you see the proper time. The proper time is the time where the two events happen in the same place. So the two events are the light leaving this bottom mirror and the light coming back to this bottom mirror. And it's the same place, right? So that's the proper time. We call that T naught, and it's equal to the distance the light travels divided by the speed of light, which is 2L on C. So there are our sort of initial assumptions in the system. Now let's move to the right. So let's leave the mirrors there, get in a spaceship that's coasting past at some speed V. I don't know, maybe it's 10% the speed of light. So it has to be something large for this, to be effect, uh, for this effect to be noticeable. You don't get relativistic effects at low speeds, or at least not measurably, they're still actually happening. But now, if I'm moving to the right relative to this mirror, so the light ticks like this, if I'm moving this way, then from my perspective, it looks like the light's actually moving like this. So the light looks like it takes this kind of path. Mm, sure, these are right angle triangles. They're symmetric about this middle point. And let's say that the distance the light travels in total is this distance D. So it goes bing, and then bounces back off this bottom thing. So you get tick, tick, tick. Let's call this distance D on two. So the total distance the light travels is D. So this distance is uh, VT on two. And this distance is vt on 2. The total distance there is vt. So now I can do some Pythagoras to find out d in terms of l and vt on 2. I can say d on 2 is equal to the square root of l squared plus vt on 2 squared. Doesn't that mean that d is equal to two lots of all of this stuff? l squared 
feet on two on squared. Well, now I can expand these brackets out so I can get V squared T squared on four. D is equal to CT. The distance light travels is equal to the time it takes to travel it times by the speed of light. So CT is equal to that string. Now I'm going to square everything to get rid of this stupid radical thing. So I've got C squared T squared is equal to four watts of L squared plus V squared T squared on four. I'm happy, are we happy that I can cancel this with this and it'll just be 4L squared equals whatever. So 4L squared and that four gets rid of this divide by four. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get 4L squared on one side. So I'm gonna take VT squared, uh, uh, V squared, T squared from both sides. 4L squared is equal to C squared, T squared, take V squared, T squared. I can take out T squared, I can factorize, but you never thought factorizing would come in useful when you were learning it in year nine. T squared, take, right. Now I can also factorize by C squared, seems like a stupid thing to do, but uh, it's actually the goal in this case. So I'm gonna factorize everything by C squared. So um, 4L squared divided by C squared is 4L squared on C squared. The T squared is already a factor of this thing. C squared divided by C squared is one. V squared divided by C squared is V squared on C squared. And now I can take the square root of everything and get 2L on C is equal to T times one, take V squared on C squared. It's the square root of all of that. This notation seems kind of weird. Why have I rearranged the symbols in this way? Well, this is the proper time. So the proper time is equal to this thing, this time in the moving reference frame, times by one, take V squared on C squared. Remember V is the speed I'm moving at relative to the light clock. C is the speed of light. T naught is the time measured by an observer who's stationary relative to the light clock. So for whom the light leaves and returns at the same point, so the events happen in the same place. That's the proper time. This T is the uh, measured time by the moving observer. It's a dilated time, because if you look at this formula, C is a fixed number, 300 millimeters a second. You're not allowed to move faster than that. So V must be a number less than C. If V is less than C, then this is some number less than one. One, take a number less than one, is a small decimal number. The square root of a small decimal number is a smaller decimal number. And so this says that the proper time is smaller than the measured time. Or we can swap it around. We can say um, t is equal to one on the square root of one, take v squared on c squared t naught. This number is gonna work out to be so the uh, the, uh, the denominator here is a small decimal number. One divided by a small decimal number is a number bigger than one. So this thing is a number bigger than one times by the proper time. That means this time is dilated. It's bigger, right? This is the time dilation formula. This one on the square root of one tag V squared on C squared thing gets called gamma, which is the Lorentz factor. T is equal to the Lorentz factor times by T naught. There are a bunch of consequences of this. For a V that's very low for us. So if you're moving very slowly relative to this light clock, say you're moving it a meter a second, so you're just walking past it. One divided by 300 million is pretty close to zero. One take pretty close to zero is one. The square root of one is one. One on one is one. So T is basically equal to the proper time. If you're moving slowly, relativistic effects don't happen. The faster you move, this, uh, this fraction gets bigger, so yeah, the resultant down here, sorry, gets smaller, because one, take a big number, or a number close to one, it gives you a small decimal number. One divided by a small decimal number is a big number, and so the Lorentz factor gets bigger the faster you're going. Time gets dilated more and more and more the faster you go. It also does this in a symmetric way. So if you're stationary relative to this light clock, you measure the time, the tick is one second. Someone moving relative to you, measures it taking longer. If they're also sitting in a spaceship that has a light clock on board, they measure their tick as taking one second and your tick is being longer. You look over at them and see the reverse. Your tick takes a second and theirs takes longer. There's symmetry here. There must be symmetry because all reference frames are equally valid. You can't tell which inertial reference frame you're in. You can't tell whether you're moving relative to the universe. There's no such thing. There is no universal best reference frame. There is no universal stationary. Another way of thinking about it. We said, hey, light's got this longer distance to travel. 
and it's doing it at the same speed and so therefore it takes longer to do it, right? That was the initial realization. The first postulate says this speed is fixed, this distance is fixed, and so therefore the time must be longer. There's another way you can word this, or another way you can think about it. You can think about the distance as shrinking. So we can have length contraction. It's another valid way of solving the light clock problem, and it gives you an equivalent result. That is, it's mathematically equivalent to say that from one perspective this distance shrinks to explain how light can still travel this distance in one second, or you can say the distance doesn't shrink but light takes longer to cover the same distance. So you can either change the time or the length. They're both valid ways of solving the problem. Again, this problem arises from this postulate. This derivation is not uh, accessible, it's not going to show up in the exam or the tests or anything, but you need to be able to use this formula. So you don't have to be able to derive it, but you have to be able to use it. And again, I really want you to remember, proper time is observed by the reference frame where the events A and B happen at the same place. And in this case, the events are the light leaving and coming back to the mirror. 